What's up, everybody? Welcome to Talking Cinema with Mike. During this podcast, I talk about the magic of film with a special guest, and we break down what we particularly enjoyed about the movie. We go from acting and writing to cinematography and film editing. My guest today is Soundman Huck Walton from Accidental Jacket Entertainment, and we will be discussing the use of sound and the beauty of filmmaking. So let's get started. Huck. So you work with you work with sound and film. Yes. And that's where we start with the movies. Yeah. So I am currently a um, an executive producer for film. Um, I got my start in uh, production audio, so that's how I got onto sets and got used to the business and how it worked. Um, I still will do it from time to time, depending on the project. I have a boutique agency that that does all sorts of stuff for, for films. So, uh, sometimes I'm called on to help out with audio or oversee audio. Um, but when I first started, my entry was doing production sound, which basically means, um, there are, there are two key positions on a set. There is your sound mixer who essentially is the person, uh, in front of the mixing console and they are responsible for the end result. So they're responsible for the levels and and the zoom type, and uh, anything that is going to end up with the editor later on or any of the the post production part of that. Uh, the thing I got into later on was post production. So I would actually be the person um, putting everything together and uh, getting that to a client. And uh, now I'm, I'm more involved in composing, which is the reason I got into film in the first place, and also executive producing my own work and other people's work as well. What films have you done sound on? Um, my sound production, because it was uh, work that, I, that got me into the industry, was mainly independence, uh, I mean, independent productions. Uh, I started on on what a lot of people do in LA, which is uh, independent shorts, uh, you know, self funded productions that go to festival. Um, that was a long part of my start because I was so interested in getting to know the industry. I took a lot of <laughs> took a lot of very low paid gigs just to get myself on set. Um, so uh, in that role, it was it was mainly indies. Um, I could name some. I don't know if they would mean much to, to anybody. Uh, the more commercial work I've done has been um, uh, for non-narrative work, uh, like game companies, um, and then of course producing on, on music videos and such. But that that doesn't that wasn't on sound. <laughs> so uh, I, I would say probably about. I'm making this number up, but from experience. I would say 90% of the stuff that's done out here is small, independent, self, uh, self-produced self productions. And then a very small part of the equation is is the uh, schedule for you know the large four studios. Um, uh, I'm not an IATSE member, so you won't see me on any of the, the large productions. Uh, I changed course before I, there's a very, there's a very specific process to getting involved. And I'm so sorry, if you don't know, IATSE is the, uh, is the union for uh, stagecraft? So it's it's any of the mm. any of the um, uh, sound. It, it, they also uh, really any any of the elements. So it's uh, anything from sound, camera to makeup, um, uh, costume design. That's all different. What they call locals. So different a- areas of the IATSE union, um, and it's a very strict and very particular process for getting involved uh, on those sets. And yeah, like I said, my my career choices changed before I got into the weeds of getting onto an IATSE set. So I uh, I've been happy to produce on some sets that were like that, but um, but as a sound guy, particularly, I I didn't do any of those. What would you say like what films have like the best like sound design? That's a great question. I am a very big fan of Guillermo del Toro's work. I think Pan's Labyrinth is a yeah. really great example. Yep. Um, and I think this, the trick with sound is with film, you can have any quality you want because you could shoot on an iPhone and if you decided as a director 
that's the look you wanted, then no one's going to question you. You know, you can, you can have as much artistic design you want. With audio, it has to be pristine. It has to be really good. And the funny thing is, is that a lot of times for people who aren't in the industry, if they watch something with bad audio and then later watch the same thing when the audio has been doctored and, and put together and, and properly done, most people will ask what changed about the visual. A lot of people will say it looks it looks better. And our ears are so good at knowing um, are so used to what good audio sounds like that even if you don't you know nothing about audio and you don't have a good ear for it, you just on some level people know that something is either right or wrong. So it's a very important part of the process. But on production, it's all about visuals. And as a sound guy, you have to understand that. You have to know it's a very, unfortunately, a very thankless but but self motivating job, where you know how important and vital you are, and it has to get it has to be done right. If it's done poorly, you have to tell the director or assistant director or whoever is in charge at that moment, because uh, you know either they get it on set or they pick it up in post, and that's a whole conversation we can or can't have. Uh, about what that looks like, what happens when you don't capture sound on, on production. But one way or the other, it, it has to be pristine on a pro professional set or uh, or people will know. <laughs> people know. So uh, to, to go back to your question specifically, Michael, um, I, I really like what Guillermo del Toro does. People who aren't sound designers will still say, I remember my wife said to me, you can hear like every sound in their mouth as they talk. And, and, and she really noticed it, and she's not a sound person. She's like, it's just really clear and in front of you. And and I said, that's a choice. That's a choice they made to have microphones and have them in positions and have them and have a thought process from beginning to end with the film that it was important to them that what they did in post to match some shots was reflected on what they did on set in production. So... It is very clear and it's kind of, <laughs> his work is like particularly good. Uh, I think you'll hear really clean sound, especially on high concept work, meaning like anything that like fantasy, um, action, uh, you tend to hear a very clean, very upfront kind of dialogue sound. And I think that just comes with the look of the movie overall. Um, some indie movies go for a very overly natural sound where you know the it's not captured particularly close to subject you can hear a lot of the reflection in the room so there is a little bit of leeway over like what you're trying to capture but um sorry michael that was a really long way to answer that but pan's labyrinth is my is a great example of audio <laughs> yeah like i think of like like just last sunday the oscars were on i was just thinking of like the five films that were nominated in the sound category yeah like um, Dune won, and there was also Belfast and West Side Story and No Time to Die and The Power of the Dog. Mm. If, if you, you saw, saw Dune, I thought the sound design was just perfect in that. Absolutely. Dune was my favorite thing this year from a sound guy's perspective. Yeah. Absolutely. And, like, West Side Story, it was, you know... Musicals always get nominated in the sound categories at the Oscars because of the singing and the dancing and that and just everything. And West Side Story perfectly captured that, just like in the original. I agree. I agree. Have you? Um, I'm assuming you watched the original West Side Story. I yep. I saw it when I was 14. When I saw the remake in the theater back in December, I was just blown away. Yeah. Uh, do you do you have a preference between the movies? Oh, like, between, between the, original the original and the remake? Mm -hmm. Um, the original, well, like, I actually watched the behind-the-scenes video of the, the remake of West Side Story with Rita Moreno on Disney+. Plus, and she said that back in this 1961, for, like, Bernardo and the other actors who played the Sharks, they put just, like, brown face paint on them to make them look more Puerto Rican. But, but in the Steven Spielberg, Spielberg remake, remake, they actually got real Puerto Rican and Latino actors to play them. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so I, I think, think that's, that's why, like, I'm, I'm glad that Steven Spielberg did that because he's, he's just so passionate with all the films that he makes. He wants to make sure everything is accurate. Oh, yeah, completely agree. There's a there's a reverence for the art form. He really, I think he said in an article, um, this wasn't a remake of the film West Side Story. This was an adaptation of the stage musical. And I think that perspective is really interesting. Um, that he set out to have a reverence for what was done on stage and to create a film in his mind from scratch was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I noticed was, um, I, I guess, guess this is just me. I thought the violence in the West Side Story remake was more graphic than the one from 1961. Definitely. Especially during the rumble when, um, like, like that's the thing they added um, in the, Original West Side Story, it's just Riff and Bernardo who have the switchblade duel. But in the remake, before that, Tony had a small fist fight with Bernardo, like, and he beat him so bad he was like he almost, I think, like beat him to death. And that's when Bernardo got up and he drew his blade, and that's when Riff got in. But like when they stabbed each other, like Bernardo's blade was still in Riff's, you know, chest after he let go of it but in the original one he just stabs him and he falls off i, th I think they i want i think they just wanted to make it look more intense and modern i think yeah yeah it was a definite choice i also know spielberg spielberg has talked about uh because I, I really think of him as a actor's director right like a lot of directors kind of see themselves in one area of what they do is sort of their strength you know you have the 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 camera directors of sorts, not to be confused with the the, the DP, the director of photography, but th that's where they lean, or they lean towards lighting, or they lean towards, and I think he really, uh, he has a lot of skills, but he's a real actor's director. He's always, he always casts his own movies, which is rare. Uh, I know with Riff in particular, uh, he said, you know, for the most part, I just got out of his way. You know, he was offering so much to Spielberg with that character that he felt like a lot of his job was just to support, um, support what he was giving him. And uh, so I think I wouldn't be surprised if he made a lot of those choices. Um, I know they had a big rehearsal process, too, so not on set per se, but he probably made a lot of those choices, I would assume, with the actors and, and, and let some of that, uh, that performance with the violence. I know the, the scene where he puts the gun to his head. Um, oh yeah, and Riff's buying the gun that he took. Yeah, did you did you hear that that was improv? Really? Yeah. So the whole he puts the gun out and picking it up and putting it to his forehead. Um, that actor decided to do that, and and Spielberg said gold, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, let's let's get three actor, more of those. Um, uh, the, the actor, actor who played Riff, Riff in the remake, remake my, my uncle knows him. him. Oh really? Yeah. His his name is, his, his name, name is, is Mike, Mike Feist. Feist. He's a theater, theater actor, and he was in his production, Dear Evan Hansen. He was in Dear Evan Hansen, of course. I forgot. I forgot that uh, that Dan was involved. With that, of course. So yeah, absolutely. Did you have you met him? I have, I have not, not met, met Mike Feist. Feist. I've, I've met, met some of the cast of. of well, well, after, after he, he took me, my mom, my sister, sister to see him, we went um, backstage and met some of the cast, cast. But, but we didn't meet Mike. I think he was like outside, like giving autographs or something we went inside we kind of went into one of the dressing rooms as well mm, yeah yeah i have my eye on him i feel like he's going to be doing a lot i think we're going to see a lot of him did you see um i'm just seeing just thinking of all the sound stuff like what about like the sound design in belfast if you saw that i haven't seen belfast and i'm so sad because it has some of my favorite actors in it and uh I, there's no excuse for having not seen it yet uh, I've heard other people talk about it. What was your take on Belfast? I loved it from start to finish. Yeah. Some, Some people said it was too, like, soft or, like, fluffy or whatever, but I just, I guess I'm just a sucker for coming-of-age family stories. Sure. So you think it just it hit what it was trying to do on the head? Yeah, I, I saw it one afternoon, like, in the theater. It only had, like, a few people in it. Most of them were like I, like older people, like my grandparents' age. Sure. And at the end, everyone in the theater was applauding. Oh, that's great. That ah, that's I love. Oh, I love that so much. Did you? Or, 
did the audio stand out did the audio stand out to you in any way in belfast well, well, the thing, thing is, is um, Huck, in, in the movie, movie it's basically about Kenneth Branagh's upbringing, because right, Belfast right. Island where he was from. It, it was, was about, like, the Catholic and Protestant riots that were going on at the time. And, and one of the first scenes, scenes in the movie is that, you know, the little boy who stars in it, um, he's just playing with his friends in the street, and then all of a sudden, this, the, the, the riots start, and there's, like, tanks coming in the street, and, like, it's, it's kind of like, like the, the um, it, it kind of reminded me of the flashbang flash scene from Saving Private Ryan. Oh, okay. Yeah. Talk about a great sound design. Wow. You could have a, a whole hour talk about that movie, <laughs> Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, but, yeah, like, like Belfast, Belfast was heartwarming and funny, funny but it was, it was also pretty scary, too, because, like, people, people were rioting, throwing, like, throwing, like, Molotov cocktails and, like, Gas and like gas bombs, and there were tanks and soldiers in the street. It was some pretty scary stuff. Mm. Like Ukraine. Like yeah, Ukraine. I know it's it's very very uh of the time. So guys, one of the problems we're facing in the world right now is the ongoing struggle for the people of the Ukraine. Russia has been bombing and scaring them, causing them to flee the country. I can't imagine the sound same as hear from the destruction every day. All the bombs and gunfire must really traumatize them, hearing them go off every morning and every night. But there is a way you can help. You can by logging on to donate.amnestyusa.org and giving the people of the Ukraine the essential necessities they need in order to pull through this extremely difficult time. Every little bit helps. Thank you. Well, that's the funny thing a lot of my friends in the industry out here it's a, a surprising number don't see the awards I mean, the grammys were yesterday and i was talking to we're doing an album right now and um and a cast album in new york and he he asked me did you see the grammys tonight and i said no he's like me either i was in the studio recording all night <laughs> so it's it's funny like unless unless you're planning to go i think a lot of people uh do miss them and unfortunately miss a lot of the work uh, we we uh, we went to see a uh, a um, a showing a special showing of all the shorts that was really fun. So we saw the live and animated shorts uh, in theater. Uh, we try to do that every year if we can. Um, so strangely, those are more, are more likely to have seen because you can easily see them back to back and know you've hit all of all of them in one <laughs> in one go. Well, I, I saw, saw all the I, I saw, saw every, every movie, movie that was nominated for, for best, best picture before the ceremony. Do you think? Uh, do you think? Uh, how do you feel about the outcome? Do you think it it uh, made sense? I think Coda was a real surprise to win Best Picture, even though it was like a fan favorite. Like a lot of like people just started going crazy for it, and I I thought the Power of the Dog was going to win Best Picture because it got the most nominations and the most like critical acclaim. Yeah, hmm. Yeah, a buddy of mine thought the same thing. I'm really curious now, and I'm getting a shaking of the head behind me. I knew better. <laughs> how, how did you know better? I felt it. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Wait, yeah. Ian, you, you knew, knew that Coda was, was going to win over the power of the I, dog? I knew the power of the dog was not going to win. Interesting. Uh, I, I just I felt just, it wasn't What made going you to think win. that? Yeah. But, so, but it was delightful for Coda to win because um, it's just delightful for that population of people to have some such high recognition. And the story was so well written. You know? True. Right. Very true. true. I, I just thought, thought the power, power of the dog could win because of the stuff it was talking about with masculinity and jealousy and love and grief. Like a lot of stuff we struggle with still today. Mm, yeah. People thought it was like average because of the pacing, but I think like with some movies, like even if it's slow pacing, like it can still be like a great outcome at the end. And there is, it did have like a shocking like twist at the end. And which you'll, you'll find, find out, out when you watch okay. it. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's slow, slow. It's a little slow, slow burning, burning, but it's, it's kind of interesting because you're watching all the characters and like sure. how they. I'm okay with are. that. I I agree. It takes a lot of patience, and maybe it has it says something about the kind of audience you are. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course. But um, but yeah, I think uh, maybe the slow burns requires some you know just love of the genre altogether. Uh, 
uh, I think the most interesting thing that's happened in audio in a long time is the um, the amount of musical films that have come out because there was an era when you know in the MGM era uh, studios specialized in in making musicals. Excuse me, and all the yeah, like like they they go go back back to the the 60s, like. West Side, West Side Story, Story Mary Poppins, Poppins Sounds, Sounds of Music, music like, like they all came out during that time. Oliver, yeah, I mean all of these really big budget budget pieces, and and that was you know that to me was the amalgam of decades of work, right? It's all from the 30s and 40s, 50s, so it, it didn't slow down. It was like masonry; they just kept building and building and building on the art form. But I think taking that long pause, it's not that we forgot how to do it, but without without the industry, without the industry apprenticeships to understand the art form. When Marshall came out with Chicago back in, do you know what year that was? Uh, 2002. 2002, yeah. I had a feeling. Um, you know, at that point, it became the Wild West. There there just weren't departments to handle that process. And then you get very experimental, experimental work if you like it or, or hate it. Like, like Hooper, who had, you know, uh, sort of this very, going into a, going into a, pro, a, a project already with an idea in mind about how he wanted to handle sound uh, and some people really hated that and some people thought it was it was, it was creative and and uh and and brave and i think regardless it's brave you know when people do stuff like that um but i think right now you know it's sometimes i think the boring stuff is actually has the best results and what i mean by that is uh you know one of my favorite musicals to come out recently is is uh, in the heights and uh the reason for that the the team behind it uh didn't didn't rest on one idea about how to capture audio they simply took the best parts of everything they they got really really uh well uh really well executed production audio um they did uh, a lot of post recording so even you know in the mixing bed they you know they they were talking about I watched some interview with the team and it's incredible um it's a really I think anyone could enjoy it. it's a really really wonderful uh, podcast um but they talk about how it's an entire frankenstein of moments entire frankenstein of of what the dialogue leading into the music um and then some numbers they they used there's one number in particular where they used only the production audio the, what they captured from the singers and there's one in particular and I I will admit I noticed especially as a sound guy but I didn't care because it, it felt purposeful. It felt like they did that on. And then they had these large, grandiose numbers where it was entirely what they captured in the studio, and they just s- synced it to uh, um, to that process. Because uh, what I was going to say earlier is uh, about the post production is you know we have what's called ADR, um, which is the sync process of um, a surprising amount of dialogue in our favorite movies is the process of of syncing in a studio um to the picture uh of something that you know maybe there's a crane or some loud thing and and it just wasn't practical or there was lights that were too loud they had to use specialty lighting systems that you know um got in the way of good audio it happens all the time and and i've had friends that say oh i don't like adr and i said you don't like bad adr because you would be shocked how many times something you're seeing is not from the the set when it was captured. Wow. Um, Fuck, like, like yeah. In the hype, didn't get any like Oscar nominees. I am right? shocked. I am shocked because it was the buzz of the industry uh, when it came out. I mean, I've never, I didn't see, I, no musical had had so many BTS moments or so many. I'll, I'll be honest. I think one of the reasons it got ignored was you know unlike uh, Les Mis or some of these bold choices, I think they took a middle road to success. I think they made strong choices that weren't necessarily headline choices. Uh, you know, they had a director who was new to the narrative form. He was mainly recognized as a as a music uh, a music video producer. Uh, That's so wonderful. Well, oh, I, I completely agree. I think uh, I think as a visual storytelling language, uh, I think directors of music music videos absolutely could make great. Uh, musical uh, film directors uh, and I think that that movie speaks to it but uh, I'm honestly I'm just as shocked as you are that's the only answer I can think of is that maybe like in the height was like the biggest movie of the summer and then like it's like later on in the year like everyone was like forgot about in the heights everyone just got like obsessed with West Side Story why do you think it is why do you think it got ignored 
I don't know. Maybe it just came too early, and maybe the cat, like the guy who directed um, in the Heights, I forget what his name is. I've never really heard of him. I guess. Yeah, he's brand new to the scene. Yeah. Like there were a bunch of musical movies that came out like after in the Heights. There was West Side Story, um, Tick Tick Boom, Tick, directed Tick, Boom. by Lin Manuel. Yeah. Even um, the new Disney movie Encanto. Mm -hmm. Like that was gonna make a lot of. Yeah. That actually won Best Animated Feature Film last Sunday. Yeah. I think you're right, Michael. I think you hit on the head. I I think it it was un I think it was entirely the the misfortune of timing between some movies that got a lot of press and a lot of attention. Yeah, actually, Encanto and Encanto and Tick Tick Boom were Lin Manuel Miranda was on both of those projects. Yeah. Lin Manuel Miranda three. directed three. Tick Boom. Yeah. And he wrote the songs for Encanto. And yeah, and In the Heights is his is his piece. So it's you mm -hmm. know, maybe he was an overwhelm of what to what to promote. <laughs> you know, I mean, he had his own. I mean, Tick Tick Boom was a was a big labor of love for him and a stretch into a new you know a, a new realm of, of directing his own piece. Maybe that had to take priority over over In the Heights. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know. It's it's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Before Tick Tick Boom, I never knew anything about Jonathan Larson. I'm really glad that that did that. Yeah, and not to mention Andrew Garfield did a magnificent job portraying him in the movie. A real electrifying, I would say, adrenaline field performance. He was just like, he like acted his butt off in that yes. movie. Yes, big fan. That's a, such a perfect way to put that. And if you knew Jonathan Larson, he nailed it. There was a couple. Yeah. There was a couple nailed. I mean, Sondheim. I felt like I was sitting with Sondheim again. Yeah. You know, um, he did a great job. I feel like they must oh, have. Yeah, they did feature Stephen Sondheim in the. Well, he was played by Bradley Whitford in the movie. And I, yeah, I mean, I'm such a fan of Bradley Whitford in general. Um, but oh, you know what? I'm Michael. You're frozen again. You're That's frozen. okay, but we can still hear him. It's fine. We can yeah. still hear him. Yeah. There, there we go. Yeah. There it is. Um, yeah, I just thought it was spot on. I embarrassing. I'm, I don't know why I'm admitting this, but uh, there's a that um, that voice recording, and I said, "Wow, he really does a good Sondheim on that that recording." And then I found out later it was Sondheim. <laughs> I was like, "That is spot on. It sounds just like him." <laughs> Did you see him come so hard? I didn't. My wife has been trying to get me to it. Um, I, I did. It's uh, really good. It's just delightful. Yeah, here it's just the best. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've got some homework to do when we leave. I right? know. <laughs> Apparently, I got to stop making stuff and start watching stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's actually a great question, Huck. Um, sound design and animated film. Yes. What would you say is your take on that? Oh, great thing to bring up. I think it's one of the the struggles of live, is that all all of the issues that go into making a live musical disappear in 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 uh, animation. Because in animation, you are establishing the reality of your audio, uh, in the same place. So the same dialogue recording is what gets captured when they're singing, because everything is done in that booth. So there is no limitation about how to produce the world of the show with 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 audio. Um, and so, the, yeah, they just, they just don't have any of those issues. So it's, um, I think that's one of the reasons it's been such a thriving art form. The other really interesting thing about about animated movies, and I'll I'll stick to musicals for now, is that you know until Aladdin, back in God, what was that? 92? 90, yep. Ninety two. Until that's Aladdin, how. you might know this already, but until Aladdin, uh, no animated movie was built by the actor uh, that, that was hired for it. That was the, John, um, Robin Williams was the first actor uh, um, to help sell the production, to help sell the movie. Uh, in fact, oh, it was- There it was weren't really like any well-known actors like for Beauty and the Beast, which was only a year before Aladdin. Yep, yep. And uh, and there were people maybe, you know, well-known, you know, within the industry perhaps. I mean, you know, Little Mermaid, um, Jody Benson, like, you know, stuff like that. But, uh, but no, yeah, no, no big power names in Hollywood. And it was such a big deal. You know, Robin Williams was doing Ferngully at the time. And uh, that was a big passion movie for him that he almost didn't do it because he was doing that. But it was a, it was a big deal that he wanted to not be billed. He didn't want, he didn't want his name above anything on the billing. And 
there's a whole long story about why that didn't turn out the way he wanted. But but the point is, um, the uh, the the when it came to making because they weren't seeing the actors, uh, there's sort of an understanding in those productions, especially the larger ones by Disney, um, that they were simply looking for the voices that could carry the material. And yeah. right now there's a big political struggle in, in Hollywood to decide what sells a movie musical. And I think sometimes for auteurs or, or audiophiles, um, it can be hard because you sometimes end up with, with a vocal talent that feels like it falls short of what is required by the, by the project. And I think that I think that can come at the um, expense of of professionals who are really good at their job, but because it's a bit of a wild west still, and we are just now establishing uh, departments and studios that deal with movie musicals. It's fully coming back now. Um, there really isn't someone. There's no auteur in place to kind of be concerned with, you know, uh, what the vocals do and. You know, we're not doing like the Natalie Wood stuff where we where we would uh, rarely uh, where we um, overdub somebody with another singer that maybe yep. uh, you know in the West Side Story remake, remake everyone, everyone did, did their, their own singing. singing right right and you can love or hate that but it's a choice you know um, you know yeah and I think it, it it varies per production sometimes you, they nail it and they get everyone that's great and sometimes there's very pu- very public odd choices <laughs> that are made <laughs> but you just don't fall into that with i guess that was the point you don't really fall into that with uh with cartoon work because there's a a little bit more of a flexibility to say you know what voice will match this performance properly and yeah the sound design la la land's fantastic la la land was another like uh, out of the park when it comes to design i mean from every i mean i would i would be just as happy to talk about the visuals as the audio on that one i mean it's incredible I and mean, that was the um Ari was a uh, Ari is a, a prominent um, uh, Steadicam operator in the industry and uh, a bit of a dancer himself. And the the some of the the oneer you know the, the single shot sequences they did for that movie were incredible. But the, yeah, the same care was given to the audio. I mean, uh, it uh, they very similar to In the Heights did a combination. You know, they, honestly, they didn't go in there with a particular gimmick of how to how to approach the audio. They simply focused on getting usable sound from location and and peppered in um, post-production uh, recordings to get a result that they that they were happy with um, it's uh it's we are in a really high fidelity state with audio our effects and special in, in special effect movies is uh, extreme a lot of people mix in um, in Dolby which is a very specific thing to do in our industry um, it's the, it really isn't always the, the IMAX of audio <laughs> and, mm-hmm. um, uh, because musicals are so new, I think that, um, sometimes it's hard to have a standard for how energetic the final recording is. Um, a great example of something that really did that well in the team, it makes sense when you think of the team that was involved was, um, the greatest showman. Uh, Greatest Showman was was uh, Greg Wells was the music producer on it. Um, uh, Joseph Trapanese had done a lot of the early um, the early demos, and he's fantastic. If you don't know his name, he's the composer of uh, well the the orchestrator arranger for Tron. Um, uh, he did that work, um, but he's he's also on The Witcher. He's the main composer on on The Witcher, and he's just one of the most amazing up and comers as a composer. Um, but then Greg Wells took it over, who uh, he did Mika's uh, original album and uh, just a, an array of... Uh, he's worked with uh, Adele on some of her major albums and just a, a great background in, 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 in that type of music. And, um, you know, they, I think for something that's larger than life, like Greatest Showman, they made a focus, kind of like Pan's Labyrinth, to create a, a soundtrack that was larger than life. And so it's a very pristine take, and there's a lot of energy in those tracks, and it's, it's uh, it it, it re- yeah, it really carries the energy that that kind of matches our high fidelity state of films right now. So sort of the action movie of musicals. <laughs> yeah. Why is it when we go to some films, we're very annoyed that the soundtrack overrides the dialogue at times? What's going on there, and why is that missed in in the editing? That is a great question. I mean, it, it's it's hard because 
a lot of these things are are subjective and you know uh, i always appreciate a director or a filmmaker that has a point of view so regardless if i agree with the choice or not <laughs> you know if someone had a point of view that's that's fantastic um i know um the movie uh, Tenet was really berated for the choice of how it was mixed uh, simply because it was quite literally Nolan's goal to have people watch it in IMAX, which like Dolby has its own mixing atmosphere. And of course, Tenet was released only to streaming when it came out. So yes, um, uh, Tenet, I did not see in the theater because Tenet came out like right when COVID started. Right, exactly. So a lot of people complained that the dialogue was entirely buried. And when you're dealing with these uh, these surround systems, these 5.1, 7.1 systems, you know, you, you're you going to, the dialogue will sit in a range. And you basically when you're in a recording studio like, like mine, it's not really impressive to look at from this angle, but it, when you're sitting in a studio, you have your two main speakers for most audio scenarios. But if you're mixing anything in, in film, you have at least what's called a 5.1 system, which most of us know from uh, from commercial speaker setups for home home systems. But you're ten- you're essentially trying to recreate a small uh, theater experience when you're mixing, so that you have the environment, uh, including the, the sub, which is that whole point five, <laughs> and then the other speakers that make up the uh, uh, the surround experience. And that that is how it's literally mixed. So dialogue is always known to be in your center. It's a it's a center speaker scenario. Um, that's where it comes from and that's you can't change that really because that that has to be where it sits and because it sits in different speakers if you turned off your center you'd literally stop hearing dialogue you'd hear special effects and everything else everything else would just entirely disappear um so yeah how you mix like that can dramatically change it if you go from uh having a you and you have to make multiple mixes a lot of times if you go from a mix where you are expected to have that center dialogue and then everything else is doing some fun thing in the movie and now you're listening on stereo speakers on your TV system. Uh, yeah, the mix could be totally off. It could be completely wrong. Yeah, Is that easily. something that they can that's, that they should think about for the future as we move forward in sound? I think a lot of people do. I think Nolan was really out to get a certain result, and that was his choice. Um, but there are other films that I listen to, and I have to turn to someone and say, "I'm I, the, the 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 soundtrack is way too loud." Yeah. yeah, and and it's weird. It's weird because uh, it is yeah. there is no formula. Okay. It is an art. It, it's an art form. I mean, okay. just like CGI, how some people think that people go in and hit buttons, but and they don't don't realize that CGI is good or bad because it's an art form, and people have to yep. put their artistic touch on it. Same thing with audio mixing. Audio mixing is an art form. You won't get the same, the same, uh, and it's not just levels. It's there's so much going on to produce that sound. Even what you think are levels, there's other elements I won't even get into because it's a it's a whole Sorry, course. Could you say that? Um, but it's you know, but there are there's so many things that go into getting what we perceive as just levels of, of audio and, and what's higher or lower. Uh, it might sound higher and it's actually EQ or something else that's making it feel like it's higher in the mix. There's there's so much that goes on. It's it's endless. Um, but uh, but like you know, uh, the original Star Wars movies when they were remastered. That won all of the awards, and one of the prominent ones was the sound mixing. So yep. there were a lot of critics when it came out, and they had changed the levels. Now, in the original, the fight sequences, they were higher in the original, and they did get lower, or perceivably, I should say, lower in the mix. And that made a lot of people very, very angry. <laughs> and uh, so it it's hard to say, because it's not always better to have dialogue on top of everything. and It's not always better to have the opposite and uh it's kind of case per case it, i think the the most successful movies mix at a lot of stages they they have um these are engineers that take their mix to their car <laughs> and literally play it in their car they do this to this to this day you have these prominent engineers will bounce a mix and play it in their car and see how it feels in their car and ah, cool. or or like play they want to know that they want to know that that they can watch it on their phone and still you know, get the same result. And there's a lot of things they can do to tweak it so that you can play to both and and it works really well. But then you get those artists that are like, no, I want it IMAX and that's it. If they can't hear it well in IMAX, I don't I don't care <laughs> how they hear it. Um, so it, yeah, generationally it's hard to say. It's an art form. So things come and go in, in prominence. I think right now we're in a stage where 
um, effects being higher than dialogue is a trend. I definitely see that as a trend happening. Um, and it's a trend. Um, what, what exactly is the difference, the difference between sound, sound editing and sound mixing? That is a fantastic question, and it's a confusing answer, but I'll, I'll, I can explain pretty easily. Uh, so a sound mixer as a job uh, doesn't really do any mixing. Uh, a sound mixer, like I was saying earlier, is the, is the guy who is essentially overseeing. They're responsible for how the audio um, gets to recording. Um, in some cases, there is, without getting too confusing, there is what's called gain staging, which is, it's not it's not audio levels, but it's audio intensity. So if you hear like clipping in a, in a, in a song, in a, in, a, in a track where like, it sounds distorted because they're too loud, that's something mm -hmm. the mixer would make sure it doesn't happen essentially. But they're kind of the key person on set to make sure that it happens. And it's kind of confusing that they're called a mixer because there is a mixing console. And so there's a sense that that is, that is the job. And it's made more confusing because uh, the jobs in post, one of the most prominent jobs is a re-recordist. And a re-recordist's job is to take all the elements, the different elements, and put it together. Like you would expect for like a film editor. Oh. Um, so uh, the, the production world and the post-production world kind of confuse the point. Um, but so a sound editor is a more of a catch-all for the person who's involved in, in the post-production process of making the track. But... It could theoretically also be a title given to the person who does, uh, who mixes fully, or mixes an element that goes into the final, the final um, production tracks to uh, to mix a, a movie. Um, so that's that's kind of the difference. A sound a sound mixer, and it's funny. In an independent level, you'll hear people that say like, "I really need a sound mixer," and what they mean is they need someone to do post on their post production on their sound, and and you have to say, "No, I'm." And that's also a sound mixer would be um, the delineation between a sound mixer and a boom operator. So a boom operator is what it sounds like. It's the guy who or, or gal who um, operates uh, the boom. So the the um, the way it works on production is there's there's two basic ways to capture audio, right? There's the boom microphone. So here I'll show you. Why not? We'll show and tell. Uh, so, there are two major ways that a professional audio guy is going to capture sound on production. And some of these techniques will be mirrored in post. So if we need to go back in the studio and get that ADR I was talking about, um, they might try to use the same microphones again so that they can match what they got on set. So here's one of my main, it's a, this is a Shopes M6. This is called a pencil microphone, and so it's a lot smaller than you might have seen in a lot of things. This is more for indoor stuff. These tiny microphones, uh, room reflection sound, or that, or some people call it echo, but it's reflection or, or reverb, however you want to, whatever you want to call it. Um, it uh, it makes it sound more natural. So you'll see these little pencil guys in a lot of indoor recordings, and that goes on my, as you, I'm sure most people have seen, from behind the scenes. Um, so you'll literally have a guy on set or gal or or non or they, <laughs> um, something like this, and then you know this is a this gets attached, and um, and this is telescopic, and so I can get it to a pretty surprisingly long length, and I have other ones too that will go even longer because sometimes you will literally be 200 feet away from the subject, and you just have this slightly <laughs> arched <laughs> metal pole that is just extended <laughs> way out there. Um, and do, do boomers have to have very strong biceps? Uh, <laughs> you know, actually, no. Really? No, you will see the you'll see the gym rats, uh, male, female. Um, but you'll, um, you will also. Uh, it's a actually. It's funny that you mentioned that because it's not. Um, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. So I've seen very wiry uh, boom ops who just have those slow twitch muscles that can just hold something forever all day so no sometimes the stocky guys are the ones you see struggling at the end of the day or they have flat feet or you know there's a lot of things and and you know there's there's whole talks about how important it is uh sound comes to mind there's other jobs on set too but um not trying to be a hero is something that professionals talk about a lot because you know you have to be able to do this for decades and people do this long past the time where your body wants to recover quickly 
So, um, you know, that's position, that's knowing when to take a break, when not to, when to not wear your gear. Because on top, if, if you are, uh, sometimes you have to be one-man band. Sometimes you have to be the sound mixer and the sound op and the boom op at the same time. And, and they're not two different roles. And when that happens, you're looking at a, a vest with a, you know, a big box that handles both your sound mixer, um, the connections for this, and then also these guys, as I'm sure most people understand, these are lavalier microphones. Um, so these are the two ways that are captured. You this can, this can be very cleverly put on your talent. And um, I always half joke, because it's actually not a joke, that a sound guy is also, or, or sound person is, um, is also a costume designer because <laughs> it's really important for professional sound people to know uh, how clothing works. And a lot of times, even if last looks, which is the term we have for uh, everything that has to happen before we're ready to, to shoot, uh, even though that comes uh, from the, the, the part, the, um, uh, the dressers, um, you have to play an element of that because you might have to hide this in a very particular way. And, um, but a, a really prominent, uh, sound production uh, artist <laughs> once said that lavaliers capture audio, but booms capture performance. Got it. And that's mm -hmm. where the struggle is when you're when you're doing this. Uh, it's a lot of novice um, filmmakers will assume they can get a lot of their you know a lot of their material from these guys because it just seems easier that way because they're they're wireless they're far away. And that can happen, and we have good microphones to do that. But, but these guys are more. This is a very isolated thing. It's 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 best prominent use is like non narratives, like documentaries or things where it's fine to just hear a clean. Uh, but you you actually want this is a little destructive. You want to hear a little bit more room, as we call it. You know, more of the the sound of the room in your recording because that's how we hear things. You know, we don't right. go into a warehouse and hear no echo. That's not how you. That's just not how sound works. So you yeah. want it you want it to be clear and, and close if you can, but you also want a microphone that has a large enough uh, capture point, uh, it's called a diaphragm, um, that it, it processes it closer to what the human ear is used to hearing. Um, and so that's that's one of the the solutions you have to have when you when you're working on a production is you know, how do you give them the best use of this guy uh, and like I said there's other ones that are much longer and they're a little bit more telescopic so you don't you don't have to be as close to the talent and you still get a really clean source and you know there's a lot of different tools in our arsenal but um but yeah that's the bottom line of of capturing it <laughs> um back to the um you said that Guillermo del Toro was one of your favorite filmmakers um how about this? This wasn't on me, but what about, um, did you see his newest film, Nightmare Alley? I did. I did. What did you think of the sound design in, in that movie? Like, I, you know, it I loved it. I, 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 I really loved it. Um, I, he has a relatively new team since, um, by team, I mean, he's a new DP. His original DP retired. Um, not retired, I'm sorry. He, he's, he's become a director uh, for the most part. And so, uh, his new DP started working with him on Shape of Water. And yeah, wow. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm sure you know all about it. <laughs> but uh, he... Uh... I know he did the cinematography for The Shape of Water a couple years ago before he did Nightmare Alley. Great, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's interesting. Um, you know, on, on, a vi on a visual level, uh, he's fascinating. He, he shoots on what's called 185 ratio. Um, and I don't know how familiar you are with with ratios for 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 film um but essentially um well also for anyone who sees their hears this <laughs> um most of us know ratios because of of our phone ratio like uh and it's called um that's like a um a four three and essentially it's just the it's just the size of your screen on your phone and then um you know there's a long it's a, it's a whole conversation about the history of, of ratios and how that came to be um um, the ratio that we use, the short the short story is the ratio that we use is the best combination of um, the box ratio that film used to be on and how TVs used to be produced. And then when we had HDTV, they needed a new ratio to not have that thing on your screen that says 
this you know this scene has been re-edited to fit the format of your your your, your... so uh, it's not necessarily the most artistic ratio that we use. It's just the one that has the best elements of the the square space and the the more letterbox uh, or uh, uh, formats that that you see. Uh, and so anyway, um, but uh, Del Toro uses what's called one eight five, and it's it's just about the size of your t of your uh, HD TV. It's a little bit cropped in, so technically it's wider is what it is. It looks cropped in because it's longer on the sides and it has to fit that box. So it's literally just a little bit in. But the interesting thing about 1E5 is it's the golden ratio. So oh. that they use in art. So that framing fits the golden ratio. So for him, he, he is in a lot of ways a visual artist. Well, well he literally is a visual artist, but he, in a lot of ways he's a, you know, he's a, a drawer and a painter. So he sees all of his framing yeah. From that perspective so and that's not normal that's that's a uh, other directors do that but he's very staunchly 185 you yeah know, like Huck, um Guillermo del Toro has a nightmare has a notebook of like all the designs of his films and then like um there was the production design for Nightmare Alley the the amphibian man the creature from the shape of water yeah it's like he always knows how to make his movies like visually stunning. Stunning, yeah. That's what I, that's what I like get out of him after after watching The Shape of Water and Pan's Labyrinth and now Nightmare Alley. I think I've gotten that like way of how he like makes films. Oh, absolutely. That's such a good point. And if you ever get, a, I'm sure you've seen him talk, right? You've seen his uh, him give any talks. I've seen him like do interviews on Jimmy Kimmel. If you get a chance, I'll off, off of this, I'll, I'll just send you some stuff. But um, I got to see him in live. I got to see a um, the anniversary at the Academy Museum of uh, Pan's Labyrinth. It's probably why it's fresh in my head right now. And that's actually what I was speaking to earlier when my wife noticed it. We were at that screening. And he did a talk in person afterwards. And it's the second time I've heard him talk, first time in person. Uh, such a philosopher and such a poet when he talks about the the art of filmmaking and his experience experience as a filmmaker it's always a pleasure it always brings tears to my eyes to hear him talk as he he's just so eloquent and it has a beautiful take on the art forms he makes especially because he makes uh not to give away the things he talks about but the, his his appreciation for the beauty of monsters is really fascinating and his talk yeah, about like, that yeah i read like the um the, the design of the amphibian man, the shape of water, he drew inspiration from the creature from the Black Lagoon. Right. Way yeah. back in the 1950s. Yeah. Yeah. It's, he's got a great reverence. But, um, uh, but yeah, so I, I, uh, yeah, I think um, the, uh, I like his new team. I loved his old team, but it's, it's fascinating to see someone who's already great continue to grow i mean any of these greats right i mean you, you can watch spielberg add to his film lexicon as his career continues and yeah. you know they even spielberg has like the same people working on his movies for like the past couple of decades yes yeah yeah he <laughs> he knows what he likes <laughs> it's and they're his people i mean that's the funny thing like you don't see them working on much of anything else it's so funny um we were watching, uh, I went on a writer's retreat for a, a musical that we're doing. We're doing this uh, film musical called Seance the Musical. And it's a, a horror, uh, it's a horror musical film. And um, we're, we're super excited about it. And uh, we just did a writer's retreat for it recently. And we were watching a bunch of like, just feel good movies from our childhood. And we're, we're uh, it, uh, oh God, which, what was the, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. We're watching Raiders of the Lost Ark. And... Uh, you know, Spielberg has these really famous oneers, which again, for those who don't know, it's like, uh, you know, sequences that don't stop, you know, it just continues on. There's no cuts in it. And, uh, he's famous for his short oneers. They're not like big movie oneers. They're just small sequence oneers where like shots that could have been broken up are just really expertly done in single takes. And, you know, he doesn't really follow you with the camera. He makes you come to the camera and it's, it's really, really fascinating how he, how he approaches it, and, and, and um, Guillermo del Toro does a lot of the same stuff. He he said in this interview that I saw him do uh, that uh, he remembers the two times ever that he put the camera on sticks, so put the camera on a tripod, 
ever. <laughs> this poor DP is always moving. He's always doing something in the shot. So they, they never get those kind of generic coverage shots. It's all some type of movement or or reestablishing the frame as, as it moves on. And, and the reason I bring this up in an audio conversation is that I have to tell you, as brilliant as they are, that scares the crap out of me. Like you have to have the best tools and the best people because that is a nightmare scenario for a sound person. Well, because a lot of times, um, not to get too techy or nerdy, but um, a lot of times you'll get these shots and you want it, you have a mic you know you want to use and you know it's going to go really well. And then they'll do these wide shots. And then what you expect is that most filmmakers will then go in later and get what we call coverage, which is like, okay, you got the scene and your your big establishing shot. Now we're gonna go in and get tights or we're gonna get these middle shots. And and you kind of use that as like the main editing tool for what the what the, uh, the audio that you captured. And you know, even if you go to the wide, you might even use the audio continued from one of those other cut shots because the wide isn't as obvious that they're talking, but you get these shots that are like, some of them are wide open or, you know, and they're just trying all these crazy things. And you're, I, I'm thinking as an audio guy, I'm like, that is what a nightmare to solve. Like bless them for doing something wonderful and, and beautiful, but oh man, like they, <laughs> their audio guys have their work cut out for them. <laughs> Talking cinema with Mike brought to you by Nike Shoes. Hey guys, you ever wanted to make your own sound? Well, now you can thanks to Nike shoes. That's right, Nike shoes. The swiftness from their special sneaker can help you make you run so fast that you create your own sonic boom. So go out and get yourself a pair so you can join in the fun. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's where a lot of my introspection comes from and why musicals come up. I mean. I think it came up originally because your question about what this current state of, of audio and where that's going. And, you know, it, it seems that talking about musicals just makes sense because that is probably the newest element that has come into modern filmmaking. I mean, we constantly push the bar on on um, on big action movies and whatnot. But to be quite honest, the the art of making the audio element of that hasn't really shifted over the years. There's not much to say about that um you know what they did on game of thrones is basically the same thing they did on lord of the rings or anything before that and um but musicals is probably yeah probably the most unique entry back into the cycle of having musicals again in film is probably the most you know modern um modern effect of of, of audio and, and, and films but but yeah so a lot of my stuff is coming from the our process of putting that together i mean a lot of things that we've been thinking about and and have to question about how we want to uh, handle the, the problem and um, it's been really fascinating. We have lots of uh, what's called previs or pre -visual visualization. It's a uh, and a lot of the a lot of the behind the scenes you see on action movies. It's when you see the the animatics, which is just like little sketches of what they're going to do, or or you see that turn into like low quality CGI. All that stuff comes from all the the pre visualization process or. In some cases, like West Side Story, like you talked about earlier, it might even be rehearsals, literally, with the actors. And um, so we go through that too. That, that can be like they do crazy stuff. They they test cameras. You might you might see directors. They'll rent a bunch of lenses and see what look they like the best. So there's so much. Pre-production isn't just okay. How are we going to make this movie? Pre-production could happen a year before that even or more. And it could be like establishing a tone or, or finding elements they want to use. And so part of the fun for us because it is this kind of wild, wild west of of uh, of musicals right now is how do we want to tell that story um, and our solution right now is we you know our uh, we're we're looking into uh, multi micing sets so we would take like um, microphones like this guy uh, which is actually a studio grade microphone it, this is used on instruments and professional um, recordings and whatnot uh, so you might have something like this on the talent but we might also on the same level almost like if you see like a like uh, the president give a speech <laughs> we will have we might have a couple of microphones and maybe multiple boom operators at a time um who are capturing different levels and and areas of a performance so we can go in the studio later into a live room which is like a a really big recording room and capture them like a like an animation like you're asking earlier at the same time so now we have similar sound sources we can use so that when the mixers decide Oh, that didn't that worked better in recording than it did in on set. T 
to me, it's all about, and this is where it's been frustrating for people, it's about that line when something goes from dialogue into song. And, you know, it's a choice. You know, you have things like Moulin Rouge where they don't care at all and it's fine. It's it's fun. But it it very clearly goes from <laughs> from dialogue to now we're in a recording. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a choice. But we, we're kind of playing around with, like, how do we... How do we get closer to animation? How do we get closer to not perceiving a difference between dialogue and and sound, but not doing too much dialogue where you lose the energy of the music? Because that, I think that's really hard to capture is the the, the fun and vivaciousness of, of live shows and having that energy. And um, you know, we're working with music producers like like Rob Shear, who's really wonderful at that, and and that's kind of their fort. Um, but yeah, so anyway, that's that's kind of our pains. That's our problem solving is in pre-production is all that that previs stuff where we try to figure out not just what the camera's going to do, but you know, in a musical, we get to shine. <laughs> in musicals, we get to matter cuz people uh, also are going to want that album. So <laughs> <laughs> Okay, guys, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Huck, for taking the time to talk to me today about the wonderful art of sound. Tune in next week where I speak to Tony-winning Broadway producer Daniel Stone about the wonderful musical Little Shop of Horrors. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Have a good day.